Welcome to the If You Build It, Will They Learn podcast, a show dedicated to modern learning and development with your hosts, Daniel Mendonca and Scott Babcock. It's podcast day. Welcome to the show. This is If You Build It, Will They Learn. I'm Scott Babcock. I'm back uh, on the mics with Daniel Mendonca, your co-host. And uh, Daniel, the question we're always asking, how you doing? Doing well today, Scott. We're uh, recording this a little earlier in the week. I know uh, everybody thinks we do these live and they just get posted right away, but that, that's not the case. A little earlier in the week. Um, clean shaven today, feeling fresh, feeling clean, excited for uh, another pod. Looking looking babies, babies behind smooth there, sort of. Look at that. Uh, and younger, younger, always younger. Uh, I don't do it because I look like a small toddler whenever I... Uh, shave everything off. So no one wants to see that. Uh, but yeah, so today, uh, weird intro. Uh, I, I don't know. I went backwards there, but maybe it's the new day in the week. I went a little reversed my sentences somehow at the beginning there, but that, that, that'll happen. That's the fun you're getting here on the, if you build it, will they learn podcast? <laughs> it's always something new every time. So, uh, we want to talk about something kind of different today. Um, based on a conversation we actually just recently had last week, Daniel had this with one of our clients, um, but they were kind of dialoguing through the fact that they are starting from basically nothing uh, and they want to get a new platform up and running. Um, and so they're looking to accelerate very quickly uh, from zero to 100, if you will. Um, and they want to understand kind of what that process looks like. So we thought it'd be fun to talk today a little bit about some tips, tricks, things to consider if you are ramping up, thinking of going digital, thinking of getting a new LMS, thinking of starting your first LMS, how do you sort of approach that? Because that can be sort of a daunting task. It seems very large. How do you break that up into ta into steps that will easily sort of translate into a successful implementation of a brand new process? So we want to spend some time on that today. I think it's going to be really fun uh, and Daniel and I have definitely gone back and forth on ways to do this better over the years. Um, so hopefully we refine some stuff for you and you'll get some, uh, some cool insights out of it. Without further ado, let's get started. So if we're going to start this off right, let's set the ground rules for our conversation. Uh, you are a company. Um, I don't know that size necessarily matters because we've dealt with clients who are, are large, small, in the middle somewhere. Um, but the premise is... You either have never had an LMS or you've had some very rudimentary LMS stuff, maybe just for simple compliance, um, but you really haven't gone down a large implementation. So we're not just transferring over what you had. You're kind of starting from a place where you don't have many e-learnings, you don't have much that's in digital, uh, perhaps you've done everything in classroom, so it's all just paper-based, um, and you want to get going on an LMS. Um, this could be to reach internal partners, uh, so your own employees. It could be external enterprise, where you're trying to reach other uh, people you work with that maybe are outside of your organization. But you are starting from the ground zero, and you need to escalate quickly to get in your entire new training platform uh, with it locked and stocked and ready to roll for all of your new learners. Yeah, I was going to add to that, Scott, too. I, th I think this biggest, the biggest transition moment is, um, and in the conversation that I had last week, is you're going from, this is how we run our business. Oh, yeah, and we need to train those people, too, to here's my business strategy and plan, and here's my training plan, and here's how they work together. So I think that's the biggest, uh, because that's always the, the phrase we hear of like, well, yeah, we also need to train those people. And I think it's it's making that transition and that mental shift to hear of our two strategies together. So let's let's start with uh, how we sort of often hear about this and sort of your your initial setup, right? So we, we've tasked you with this is where you're coming from. How did you get there? And I think it, it's always kind of uh, amazing to us that this is sort of the starting place with so many of our interactions that... Uh, Often what happens is uh, someone at a level, usually somewhere above you, comes to you and says, hey, Daniel, uh, I know you're the director of sales and marketing, but here's the deal. We need a learning management system. I heard about it in this podcast uh, called If You Build It, Will They Learn? Or mm -hmm. I was at this conference and this guy was speaking um, and he was super enlightening. Uh, he had a goatee and he wore this TriStar baseball hat, <laughs> whatever, right? Like, um, But I, we need one. And I know you really don't do that but I'm going to need you to pull it together. And uh, now granted I'm, I'm being a bit facetious, right. And trying to make it a little bit more fun, but the reality is it's not that far off. A lot of times the guy or the girl or the lady or the woman uh, who gets tasked with 
I need you to do this doesn't do that, right? That's not their goal. They've not, they don't maybe have a background in learning. They're part of the HR department or they've done talent acquisition and recruiting. They've done marketing. They're part of the sales team. They're part of the operations teams. Um, and this is now another hat that they're being asked to wear. And a lot of times they don't come with a background that enables that. So let's start with that premise that a lot of times that's how this works is that you are someone in the organization who gets tapped on the shoulder and says, we need this, execute. Um, so Daniel, if you, if you're starting from that frame of reference, is there an area that you think to yourself, okay, I got to begin here as I begin this journey, because I don't really know what's next. Step, step one for me is always figuring out everybody who could potentially be involved or who could potentially benefit from this organizational change or shift in learning. Um, you in this, in this scenario have be give, you know, been given the, the responsibility to be the champion of this new learning and training initiative, but by no means are you the person who is, is solely responsible for it or is solely going to benefit from it, uh, when it, when it is positive. So don't work in a silo. Um, don't operate in a silo, um, because there's so many new ideas about that. So for example, if you're, let's just, let's just throw the scenario and you're, and you're a product manufacturing company, you have a product to which you sell. Uh, to a market. It doesn't matter what that product is. Um, you may have a retail division. You may have a commercial division who could who could benefit from it. You may have distributors and dealers and internal salespeople and all sorts of different divisions that that are involved in the the sale development distribution of this product. And this platform, this training platform, is going to reach everybody. So step one is always figure out who all the stakeholders are who can be impacted by this, who can benefit from it, whose business strategy and direction is going to influence uh, what you produce and get everybody on board and talk to them about the initiative and, and learn what they would love to see out of this general initiative. Yeah, and I think, you know, so you kind of outlined an area where we're bringing in all these channels, if you will, from a sales perspective, right? And, who you know, I've got a commercial division, I've got um, a distributor division, I've got all these things. But um, don't forget all the other people who have input. Uh, the number of times we get halfway down um, a conversation of design, let's say, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, you know what we need to do? We need to clear all of these graphics through our marketing team. Uh, that happens a lot, right? And all of a sudden you find yourself... Uh, crossing your fingers and kind of holding your breath, hoping that whatever you've designed to that point with the client um, will pass the brand standards or the guidelines the, that we believe to be true. Um, and most of the time you're close enough that you get, you get pretty close as minor tweaks, but every once in a while it's like, yeah, no, you've, you've violated like three major brand elements and we have to go back to ground one, right? Like stage one again in design and concept. Um, and so like, I almost think of it as, you know, really slow down, Think about all the people who need a voice at your table as you're designing these things and planning these things, because um, otherwise you find you get halfway down all of a sudden you're going backwards, uh, and that can actually take more time. So uh, I know we all get very excited to start to see things come together and everything else, but um, you know, don't forget legal. They always get left behind. Maybe nobody wants to go talk to them. I'm not sure why, but you know, have we cleared the policy statement or the registration process for your site? Um, brand standards and marketing, like have we appropriately used the logos and do we have the right color tones and things like that? Those are just, those are folks that unfortunately when we think about learning, we don't always bring to the beginning of the conversation. Um, but if you bring them along early, uh, you find it's much smoother along the way and you don't have to take two steps backwards every once in a while. And just to add on to that a little bit, I think that, that we've talked, we've talked in the past about perspective um, and how it relates to these sorts of training and learning and, and these sorts of initiatives and, and being in training for a long period of time or learning for a long period of time, you can start to think about things a certain way, but bringing in different departments who have different needs, different business objectives, uh, different organizational objectives and kind of roll up to the top of the organization I think getting everybody's perspective in there. Um, I think Scott, I won't steal your phrase, but you just, you just mentioned slow down, but really slowing down and making sure you gather everything will allow you to speed up in the end and move through uh, your process uh, more fluidly. That way you can, can advance and, and at least in your minimum viable product that you're going to put out um, in the learning space, uh, be successful and, and be inclusive to everyone who, who's going to get touched by this new initiative. I, uh, 
I don't know why all of a sudden this popped into my head, but uh, I, I love Modern Family, the TV show. And Phil, uh, he's doing an exercise on like a fire evacuation, I think, if I remember right. The scene, I'm not positive, but it's uh, fast is slow and slow is smooth or something to that effect. I can't remember. I'm probably butchering it. But um, but I think that actually does make sense. Sometimes you think you're going to move fast, but the fastest way to get to where you want to be is to sometimes take a slow down, mm-hmm. not skip steps, not rush and trample everybody. And then if you do it smooth, uh, or if you do it slowly and you, you really take your time and do it the right way uh, with patience and, and dedication and kind of thoroughness, the process actually ultimately goes smoothly. And so I think uh, it's counterintuitive sometimes to think of slow down to speed up, but uh, it does it does play out. Um, so with that in mind, Daniel, like obviously now we've gone through the process, uh, we've taken our time, we've assessed our business, we've talked to our business partners, we've kind of identified who's out there. And, and the reality is, as you start to talk to some of these folks, uh, you might actually find some hidden wells of talent, right? Like there could be somebody who's uh, currently working in the marketing team who actually has a background in instructional design or did it for a while in college as an intern or I don't know, whatever. Um, so look for those pockets of expertise. But I would imagine you're still probably going to find some areas where maybe that that skill level or that capability doesn't exist on your team. So um where do you think you go? Like, so if you can't find the the expert in the room within your department or within your teams, like, do you have any advice on seeking out some of those other areas? I think it starts with one of my favorite uh, values and uh, personal characteristics that you just you know outline there, Scott is is self awareness, the idea of of knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know, and um, looking to fill those gaps. Um, like you, you know, we started with you're, you're really creating something new um, that didn't exist before. So understanding where you can provide expertise, where you can provide influence, how you can, you can be the positive impact that your company needs in this initiative, and then figure out where you can't be and start having those conversations. And I think um, what you're going to find when you have these conversations is a lot of people you know, in your organization. And, and, and truthfully, if you're, if your business or your company is going down this path, chances are you have a pretty positive culture in terms of learning and, and collaboration and growth. And you're going to find some pretty eager people to help with things that they're passionate about. And just because someone works in talent acquisition or someone works in marketing or sales, doesn't mean they, they aren't passionate about learning um, or have done some of that work. So I think having those conversations with stakeholders and, spreading the word to your um, coworkers uh, and other people with your organization about what you're doing may help you you dust off that diamond in the rough that may say, hey, you know what? I'd love to help you with that. Um, yeah, I'm in marketing and, and I know I don't typically go over there, but I'd love to you know, maybe get on a committee or help start a committee where who could help drive this forward. So I think having as many conversations as possible um, around things you maybe don't know about um, or don't feel confident about is a great place to kind of build that foundation. And I think that that begins like sort of the internal seek out to find and, and try to explore who might have additional information. But uh, I, I would also say, don't be afraid to ask for help externally too. Um, and sometimes you have to build that into your process, right? Um, one option is, you know, do I need to, do I need to get a consultant? Do I need to have somebody come in who's got experience in doing what we're talking about, who can kind of walk me through the steps? Um, obviously that, typically is going to come with some funding or some expense that you might need to plan for as part of your, your rollout plan or, or your RFP or whatever that might be that you're trying to explore. Um, but don't be afraid to say, hey, maybe we don't have all the answers, but there's someone out there who does is the reality. Um, there's a lot of folks who do this for a living. And, and the reality is they love to be able to talk it through and have conversations uh, and they'll be able to help you out. So I would say that's that's an important part is don't be afraid to ask for help externally, but also just start to look for your resources, um, whether it's, you know, a, a stellar podcast between two guys who love doing this kind of conversation and hopefully are giving insight and ways to move forward. But um, attend a conference uh, right now is a great time to attend conferences in many ways if you're looking for information because a lot of them are, are free or low cost and they can be done from your home and they can kind of fit in around your day. Um, but if, if we ever get back to a place where we're doing things live, be, don't be afraid to go to a conference and start to just absorb in these breakouts and workshops that you're able to attend. Start reading. Uh, the documentation online is going to be really powerful. There's a lot of examples, uh, blogs, white papers, journal articles, case studies that you can kind of pull up. 
Um, but go looking for those resources to help you get smarter as well. I think those are uh, definitely areas where um, too often we, we, we try to pretend that we know all the answers or too, you know enough of the answers to get by. Um, sometimes you just have to be to your point of saying, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know this, uh, and, and, and know that about yourself, um, and, and seek out that help and those answers. Yeah. Just to add to that, I think, and I know I've identified this in learning space and, and it's no different for soccer, for me, uh, from a coaching perspective, and I'm sure Scott, you've seen it in different things, but like there are, there are endless communities and groups and forums and things out there where you can talk with like-minded individuals who have similar issues um, in in the learning space. So I'm sure if you went into some of the L&D forums on LinkedIn, uh, as a good example, you would find some people who aren't in learning as the primary role, but have learning as one of their job duties or managing LMS as one of their duties who would be more than willing to, to share their experiences with you. Um, and I think those conversations, I mean, Scott, I know you and I have both, you know, lent an ear to um, friends, old, old, old clients of ours, old coworkers of ours, who are in different areas of their career now and involve learning and have needed advice or something, you know, be a, be a sounding board um, or a thinking partner um, on things. So I think having those conversations is a big place to go because people are willing to share. Um, Learning development is not some secret sauce uh, that uh, is is out there. And um, like said, going back to knowing what you don't know and having those conversations is um, can be very, very influential um, for you. Scott, I had a question for you around, I guess, this, this topic. I mean, being that it's something new for you and, and you – you may think something's a gap, but how do you really, like, is there any suggestions you have around understanding those gaps um, and, and what are important, the, which ones of those gaps are important to your organization? So you prioritize your time. Cause like you said, it's, it's not this person's primary job. So prioritizing your time into the top, the top priorities. Now that I've said priority, priority about 400 times in one sentence, but you get what I'm trying to say is like looking at that and saying, what do I spend my time on? Yeah, so I think we've talked about um, the importance of feedback. I think, and I don't know. I guess if I'm if I'm kind of evaluating uh, your question and figuring out my own priorities and my answer here, um, well, I, I think that it's important. We talked about like bringing along your business partners and things like that. They're going to have a lot of insight on what they need. Um, but what a lot oftentimes is is sort of lost in this is going out to the folks that are going to be your learners. Who who is your audience? Um, and specifically start talking to them about what it is they want out of training. Uh, what do they want to get from a knowledge base? What do they need from a skill set? What are they gapping on and being successful in their own abilities? That's not to say you're going to meet every need. Uh, and, and what Daniel says, what I say might be similar, but they might not have exact specifics. But you'll get a good sense of organizationally, if I'm trying to train my salespeople or I'm trying to train my external business partners, or if I'm trying to train my manufacturers in a warehouse, um, what is it they feel like they don't know? Or what is it they feel like they can't attain through knowledge right now? And I think you can start to use a lot of that feedback to really say, okay, these are our critical needs. Um, Because so often times you're going to have, you know, as we've just told you to invite a lot of voices to your conversation, those voices can also become deafening uh, sometimes to the point where it's, it's a lot of noise. Um, so I think you have to find like your official sounding board and really set those as your guiding principles. Like this is what we need to accomplish. And then we're going to accommodate business partners to get them what they would like to have be a part of it. Or we're going to, we're going to take their conversation and base it around our, our end users, which are really the most important people. Um, I know you're obviously Danny, you're in sales and I, you and I have been doing client work for a couple decades or whatever now. Um, and the reality is it, the client is always right, right? The customer is always right. That That's where we have to sit and focus. And um, if the client's not happy, they're not going to keep coming back to, to, to buy from you or in this case, to learn from you. So um, I, I like to start with what do my users want and sort of prioritize based on that as I'm, I guess, as I'm identifying gaps. Because you're going to find, especially if you're starting from scratch, they're all gaps, right? Like you, you probably have so many uh, holes in the dam to fill, if you will, that uh, it's, it's trying to identify the big ones. And, and I guess user feedback for me would be where I'd start. 
So did I answer the question at all? Like that's no, very long winded, I think. But yeah, no, I, think that was you, big I think you narrowed in there. You made me want to kind of dive into something, um, kind of that that involves part of this next conversation. When you think about, I guess your the users and the people who are going to be involved, their feedback. Um, typically, people's feedback has some sort of recency bias attached to it, um, and with recency bias, you can be short sighted. So. When you talk about um, that and potentially worrying about today, but knowing that this needs to be kind of a long-term solution for you, I guess, how do you think about that holistically? Yeah, that's, that, that is uh, at the crux of so many of the conversations that we have with people is, again, you know, you were tapped on the shoulder and said, Daniel, I need an LMS and I kind of want it by September or whatever. You know, I mean, there's always a timeline, right? Get this mm-hmm. up and running. Uh and so often it's, I need to check that box for whoever it is. And this, this happens at a more micro level too. Like I need a training on using the new POS system, right? And so Daniel goes out, he's got that as his marching orders from his boss. And he says, cool, I'm going to make this one training. And then that, that'll be checked off my box. And I can say, boss, I did my job. And then I'm just going to move on. But um, with that kind of like, this is the immediacy of the moment. We often lose sight of what, what is the bigger picture, right? So thinking bigger, thinking more holistically to what's the long-term strategy, I think benefits you in this as well. Uh, so when we talk about starting up a new platform, you're kind of starting from the ground up. Yes, you want to get it running. You want it to be out there. You want it to be functional, but that will get people in the door the first day. But how do you keep them there 30, 60, 90 days after? How do you keep them six months or even six years later? And I think the biggest thing is, start thinking about if I want to do this one task today, it's ultimately going to really drive a behavior. And when that behavior happens, I want that to continue on. And what would drive that behavior and that behavior and that behavior? Um, So that you're thinking about things like it's not a single piece of content, but is it a larger curriculum that takes you from A to B to C to D on a more of a progressive model? And you need to plan for that so that you're not just putting one piece of content out now. And then six months from now, oh, crap, we need this other piece. And they end up disjointed because they weren't thought about in a cohesive plan. Are you building things like learning paths? Do learning paths make sense for your learners? Uh, In some cases they may, in some cases they may not. Um, But really thinking about the LMS as a big picture, long-term strategy as with short-term deliverables, I think is a great way to start and approach that. Uh, I don't know if you have some other thoughts on ways you might be able to tackle some of that. Yeah, I I think you're you're right where I, I think you should be. But the other part of it is um, dictating in in a situation like this, success is going to be dictated by obviously the person who came and asked you and gave you this request. Um, People who are influenced by the initiative. Um, I always try to advise, I know our clients um, and when we go to our customers about creating KPIs and in being in control of the KPI. I mean, I think you going through this process, you you know what you want to get out of it short term and long term. So it's in, in, in being involved with creating this plan. I always look to also recommend that they say, OK, here's this plan and here's how we're going to execute. And we're going to purchase this LMS from this great company out of Windsor, Ontario, um, who has a Nashville office uh, as well. Um, but also here's how we're going to measure success of the program rather than allowing it to be kind of um, objective or uh, sorry, subjective to the people who are involved where they can just come back and be like, ah, this isn't successful. So creating that, that the, those measure, those measuring sticks for you. So you can show them, Hey, look, he did this and, and it was successful because of this, this, and this that we set out to achieve prior to. So I think all those things that you talked about thinking long-term planning, the overall, program that's not just worried about today and also thinking about how we're going to measure it so we can prove it to be successful or not uh, and make adjustments. We're, we seem to be very subtle, passive aggressive marketing today <laughs> in terms of Halo. So I, I, I'm going to go at what I think you were trying to say there, Daniel, because it's it's really all about uh, sort of your vision is that you, you need to set learning your objectives for your site yeah, um, and then and measure against those. So it's, again, always comes back to objective, objectives with Daniel, uh, but I don't think he's wrong, right? So it is about uh, once you've had, got this feedback, you've gotten the information, you've organized your business partners, and maybe this is a great way to sort of wrap our conversation today, but you've done all of that legwork we talked about in the kind of the first beginning of this conversation. 
what is it you want your LMS to be? What do you want it to stand for? What is it ultimately designed to do? What do you want users to be able to take away and how do you want them to act differently? Those are your objectives as your LMS. And from that, you're going to define those measurement sticks that are going to say, were we successful in doing this? Were we not? Uh, if we were not, how are we going to adjust and pivot? But uh, you're, you're putting a long-term goal on this site um, and, and setting up those objectives. And, and I think that's that's the critical element. Do you know what you want it to be? Do you want it? What does it stand for? What is it going to do for your organization? And how are you going to benchmark that? And then from there, you start to continue this evolution. Um, I think as we think think big picture, and I'll leave you with this as my, I guess, my last note, um, rarely do I find that an LMS is just done. Uh, it's baked, it's finished, and it's complete. Um, I think you're always looking for what's the next thing I want to do. And that could just be what's the next curriculum I'm going to put in. Hey, we started this new job role or position or department. We need to build out a plan for them. Um, you're going to have new products or new services or new offerings or new content. Um, it's always evolving, right? And technology is going to change and things like that. I would never look at your LMS as a finished product, but an evolving product that is going to evolve just like your business does. And so um, think long-term in that sense as well, that uh, this isn't just check the box and get it done and say, I delivered. It's, you know, I checked step one, but step two is going to have a phase and there's going to be a three phase and a four phase uh, that goes along with this as well. That's kind of, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. I think, I think you're hundred percent correct. And I, I will add just a little piece that, you know, most of the time when this occurs, the, uh, the organization at hand is not uh, building their own uh, learning platform. They're typically finding a partner for them. And, and that thought process about thinking of what's next and, and how it's constantly growing um, should influence those partners that you look to work with as well. Um, and make sure that your, your learning platform or curriculum or strategy that you're putting into place uh, is flexible um, going forward. All right. What, like, I had a lot of fun in that conversation. We joked a little bit, but we got some subtle uh, hints at what we do for a living and some reminders, uh, which is fun too. Look, we, we do this for a living because we like it. We like talking about it. So hopefully we can always have an opportunity to kind of plug what we do because we're proud of it. Um, but we, we want to leave you as we always do with a little, little happy moment, a little positivity we're seeing, some things we're going to bring back to the atmosphere and, and to our audience, uh, you, the listeners, and, and kind of share something fun going on. It's fall. It's, it's almost fall. I guess not quite. It's still technically summer, but we're almost there. We're rounding that corner into fall, and with that comes football. Um, Sabrina did not like that. Uh, she gave me a dirty look for saying summer. Is, it's the summer of Sabrina here. Uh, we don't want to let that go. Um, <laughs> it's all about our producer, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, so I'm looking ahead to fall. Uh, I'm looking for it to not be a thousand degrees in Tennessee and uh, like a steam box here. So uh, cooler weather. Let's bring some of that on. But with that comes football. And with football comes fantasy football. And tonight I have my very first draft of the season. Uh, it's for a dynasty league. We're doing rookie draft. So it's a quick five rounder. It'd be a good, good warm up. And then Daniel and I, uh, for those that are maybe new to the program, don't realize we were in the championship game of our league together last year. Um, and uh, one of us won. I can't quite remember who. Um, but and, and probably this guy. Uh, and I don't have the ring in front of me to show it off. But I should have thought ahead. But um, that is just a week and a half away that Daniel and I will be uh, drafting for our fantasy teams there as well. So uh, this always just gives me a lot of fun, a lot of joy, a lot of entertainment. Um, and uh, we're doing a family league again this year as well. So my boys are pretty excited to participate this year in that one, uh, which will happen uh, this weekend, actually. So I got I got drafts galore coming my way. A fantasy football is always a fun time of year. Um, I also have some other fantasy sports going on right now. Fantasy soccer is happening because um, all the European leagues just uh, kick-started um, again, which I'm pretty happy about. But uh, my positivity point is around uh, the university. Um, it looks like we're actually going to have a season this year, uh, even you know uh, with the COVID situation still, which is great. Um, but I will say I'm kind of in uh, – soccer seven days a week every night mode right now um and it feels it feels good to be back um that's my positivity point it's been very choppy over the past 18 months since the pandemic started um we're in we're out we're practicing we're not whatever that is um and my positivity point is just the consistency of being on the field being around the team being with the players my assistant coaches, those conversations, those relationships and all of that. So pretty excited um, about that and 
happy back and I'm rooting to try to beat uh, Scott this year in fantasy um, because I can't deal with that loss again. Good luck with that. Good luck. You know, I imagine having some routine, some normalness. Uh, I think we all crave that to agree. So I, I can only imagine how nice that is to sort of be back in the routine for you there with soccer. So, all right. Well, that will do it for us today. I'm Scott Babcock. He's Daniel Mendoza, and we will talk to you next week. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of the If You Build It, Will They Learn podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Join the conversation by emailing us at podcast at haylight.com. Find us on social media at Build It, Learn It, and be sure to check us out on the web at www.haylight.com. That's H-A-L-I-G-H-T dot com.